under the flagship of the Indian Space Congress uh, 2022. This is first of its kind event happening uh, in Delhi. Uh, and why do I say that? Because you know, for a good long time in India, we have focused more on the socio-economic applications of space. And we have done really well in that domain. And while focusing more on that, human space flight uh, was kept slightly on the back burner. And we just heard from uh, Uma Maheshwaranji that uh, the capacity building didn't start in the past few years. It started back in 2002. So we've been at works for the past 20 years. And the world has moved rapidly in those uh, two decades. We've seen the Chinese uh, spaceflight program maturing in these past 20 years. Now we are at the uh, position or you know, time and space where the International Space Station would graduate into or spin off into multiple commercial space stations. And human spaceflight is no more an agency driven enterprise, but it's more a PPP model enterprise where the public and private partnerships will happen in a much bigger way, not only in certain countries, but in the uh, world at large. And uh, to discuss all these topics and uh, to discuss all these opportunities, we have a stellar panel, starting with uh, Mr. Uma Maheshwarinji, he is the director of uh, Human Space Flight Center of the Indian Space Research Organization, uh, an entity that was recently created uh, after the announcement of Gaganyan. It has been doing extremely well despite the hiccups that were created by COVID. And in the next few months, as he said uh, in the inaugural session, uh, there will be some demonstration happening. And young and old of this country will definitely take away a lot of uh, you know, inspiration from it. And uh, when I say young and old, we have a very young person over here joining us. So I just spoke to him that, would you like to be an astronaut? He said, yes. So uh, there will be new heroes coming up in the few year, next few years. And this for us, this is the Gemini moment. For us, this is the Apollo moment, and we are going to enjoy it tremendously. But as we begin enjoying it, we would want to have great panelists amongst us. So I invite Uma Maheshwarinji, sir, please join us on the days. Then we have amongst us uh, Mr. R. Hutton. Uh, he is the project director of the Gaganyan program, uh, the flagship program of the Indian Human Space Flight Center. Sir, please welcome. Paul is already here. Paul is from the Satellite Applications Catapult, uh, a UK government enterprise which is right now spawning innovation ecosystem in the UK, in the space sector, and in the allied sectors. So welcome, Paul. Uh, George Weinman, uh, from the very exciting Blue Origin Orbital Reef team. He is part of a very exciting project known as Orbital Reef. It's a commercial space station that is coming up later in this decade, if I'm right. Yeah. And uh, there's uh, a galore of uh, activities that he would want to share with us. And then we have uh, Mr. B.M. Raghavindra from uh, uh, Lazar and Tubro Missile and Aerospace Business. Uh, Raghavindra ji has been working on the launch vehicle program for quite some time. And uh, LNT has been uh, an integral part of uh, the development of uh, all kinds of launch vehicles, including the GSLV Mark III. And in the coming years, when uh, uh, we will, or not years, months, when we start testing the human rated crew vehicle, LNT will have great contributions to it. And then we have a uh, young talent amongst us, Akshat Mohite. Akshat is a co founder of Astrobond Defense and Technologies. Uh, his company is wanting to get into capacity building for astronauts and they are very much interested in setting uh, infrastructure, training infrastructure in the country. And so welcome Akshat. And I now invite uh, Mr. Uma Maheshwaranji to uh, chair the session and enlighten us with your views of these developments. Thank you. Very good morning. Thank you, Chaitanya, for a very brief but 
crisp intro and uh, my distinguished colleagues in the panel most of them I know George Sir Paul Hutton and uh, he is uh, Ankit uh, Akshit and of course Raghavendra I know very well and there are many familiar faces in front of me also so very good morning in fact uh, what I wanted to tell here I was forced to tell there <laughs> anyway so this uh, as I said uh, human space flight uh, program as all of you know is extremely exciting if I say so it is uh, I think I've simplified it too much in fact uh, as uh, somebody pointed out or as Giri pointed out uh, uh, it is it's a fact that uh, we did start a little bit late when compared to the the global trend of course it is also a fact that uh, we were 60 years uh, practically 40 to 50 years behind at least the two major leaders I would say United States and the Israel USSR that's a fact but even though we started our space uh, our DC almost uh, in similar time uh, we started in 1963 in a very humble way by launching the Nike Apache rocket from Tumba in uh, Trivandrum the priority our priority session was totally different we took a very bold step a very innovative step and a very I would say the uh, the uh, vision of our father of the space program Dr. Vikram Sarabhai who was very clear in saying that we should be second to none in the committee of nations as far as the applications of the space technology goes for the betterment of society so this has been the enshrined policy of ISRO for so long even now and it will continue to do so so our entire trust of whatever technologies including the capabilities that we need to build which which of course included uh, the capability of making a launch vehicle capability of making a satellite and also capability of making different satellites at least at that time frame it was, we were talking about remote sensing and communication only later the the demands have gone up we have went to navigation and all such uh, diversified uh, technologies that a satellite is able to do so uh, our concentration was more on that and how that data can be translated into applications which is going to benefit the society this has been the concentration all along and this will be continue to be our concentration in future also there are no questions or no doubt about it but during this progress after Professor Satish Dhawan took over and later uh, the eminent other uh, ISRO leaders like uh, Professor U.R. Rao, uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, Dr. Madhavan Nair, Dr. Radha Krishnan and uh, of course Kiran Kumar whom you would have listened to yesterday and uh, Dr. Shivan and now presently Somnath. All of them uh, during the earlier periods I would say uh, that uh, along with the need for the societal satisfying the societal demands we also should endeavor with respect to uh, I would say uh, the kindling the scientific temper of the country that is also a responsibility to see that the next gen is also enthused and they come forward to do their activities in India rather than going abroad or something like that to carry out their activities that scientific temper should be kindled and rekindled continuous for that also we need missions of imagination which will generate the imagination of the society that is why we st slowly started venturing into planetary science missions uh, which uh, of course culminated with respect to the first Chandrayaan mission followed by Chandrayaan 2 and Mangalyaan or, and all in few a few more are there so that was one strategy shift during that time when we found that we are capable of doing all these things in between we had a very successful uh, I would say very successful experiment called SRE spacecraft recovery experiment which we just uh, try to establish whether we are capable of that and uh, I think we were the first again 
to succeed in the first attempt itself to go to space, come back and land safely and retrieve the the crew module as such. That was a very, very successful experiment which was done in 2007 which gave us a lot of confidence, yes, we are able to do this because re-entry is a very, very tricky mechanism uh, as far as human survival is concerned when you come back. And uh, as uh, I told in the morning, we started this entire uh, gamut of uh, venturing into human space flight because we were very sure that this kind of endeavor is going to enthuse the overall country. It's not ISRO alone. It is the entire country. It is the stakeholders are so many who will get enthused and they will be part of this program. I am again telling you human space flight program is not an ISRO program. It is a pan-India program. It is controlled by a pan-India committee. It is reviewed by a pan-India committee and there are many, many stakeholders involved, not only ISRO. We are only a kind of, I would say, catalyst in, uh, in bringing that project. We have the entire uh, our uh, armed forces with us for various uh, requirements. We have the academy, uh, plenty of academy are part of this with respect to designing. And as you know, from the beginning itself, ISRO has been treating industries as their our partners only. They are not our vendors. That started in 63 itself. And uh, I, you should, more than 600, 700 industries are part of us. And uh, more than 70 to 80 percent of the creations, what we need for Gaganayan is also made from industries. So industries are also part of us. So it is a whole gamut of uh, uh, stakeholders who are involved as far as Gaganayan program is concerned. And not only that, we have very strong international collaboration. Such mission cannot happen without international collaboration. And we were very lucky to have very strong relations with both USA and uh, Russia as well as Europe. That is our strength. In the first Nike Apache mission, you will be interested to know the first the Nike Apache rocket was from US while the payload was from uh, the Israel area at that time. They brought to India. So the, 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 the concept of collaboration has been there from the first ISRO launch itself. So uh, we have very strong collaboration with respect to Gaganian program. They, our uh, trainees, astronaut trainees got selected and uh, they got trained in Russia with specific astronaut requirement the training. They have successfully concluded the, their training and now they are undergoing part of their training in uh, Indian part, Gaganian part of the training in Bangalore. It is going on very successfully. And similarly, there are a host of other requirements like, you know, space suit, uh, the viewport, these are all very critical technologies which uh, for the first few flights we thought it would be more safer to have proven systems to be included rather than we inventing ourselves. But one very bold decision that we have taken is as far as the environmental control system is concerned to give the environment to the survival environment to the astronauts in the crew module when they are in space. That is extremely important without that there is no survival. We have to provide oxygen, we have to provide the partial pressure for oxygen, we have to remove carbon dioxide, we have to remove humidity, uh, the, all such of, uh, we have to maintain the temperature, at the same time it should, uh, we should uh, see that uh, safety is ensured, there should not be any fire hazard, it goes on and on. I can go on telling so many things which are, uh, take, which take an entire dimension when it is in space rather than it is in ground. So this is a very complex technology which in short, I would say to 100% no country will give us just like that, even if you pay money. So we took a decision that it will be our own indigenous design. Of course, we have the capability to design, so we are doing that. And that only is taking a little bit of time, but we have completed all the designs. Now it is time to prove that whatever we are designed is safe enough and reliable enough. So that is the entire effort which is going on now, which will commence in another couple of months with what we call as a test vehicle missions. That is, we have designed a separate launch vehicle for taking this uh, crew module up and creating failure modes at different altitudes, including from the, from the uh, launch pad itself, which is called the pad abort test, wherein the crew module will be taken away in case of an impending disaster. And that uh, underlining is impending disaster. We should have the capability to dictate the disaster ahead in time to see that astronauts are safely uh, they are able to get out. So that is the most important uh, thing which we are going to demonstrate now in a few specifically designed uh, tests which will commence from mostly from February, February next year. And then also we, we, the, the, as you know the re-entry and uh, landing after proper deceleration into sea is also a very very complex 
a very crucial technology in task where a series of balloons have to be deployed at the right time so that the deceleration happens. Otherwise, the entire thing will fall like a uh, projectile and get destroyed. So that should not happen. So that also needs a series of experimental tests wherein we are going to take the crew module up in a Chinook hel helicopter, five kilometers up and then drop in and see that the parachute is deployed. So all such exercises, all such, uh, there will be around 17 number of tests which we have to do. All of them are planned by next year itself. So like that, a series of demonstrative tests are required, which will culminate in the first unmanned mission, what we call, wherein the, the exact launch vehicle with the crew module without a man or a woman will be sent, uh, like our uh, normal uh, human mission, it will, uh, or it will orbit the uh, Earth for uh, a specified number of orbits, let's say one day or two days or three days, that we can decide any time. Then we will see that it re-enters and lands and we are able to retrieve it properly with all the paraphernalia, including the rescue team and everything. So this is the first target and we have decided that we should have two successive, successful unmanned missions. Then only we will decide for the land, for the manned mission and uh, uh, by our planning we hope that by 24 end we will be able to succeed in sending the first manned mission from Sriharikota. That is our present target now. Hopefully we will be able to meet it. We are uh, working overtime. 24 hours is not enough for us. So that is the mode in which things are happening. Uh, that's all what I wanted to brief you. Uh, I don't know what, as a chairman or a chair of this function, what I am supposed to do, I am not very clear. Probably you can lead me. <laughs> you have Thank to you. speak more than us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mama Ishwaranji, for explaining to us the way the Gaganyan project, the Indian Human Space Flight Program, is being put up brick by brick. Uh, and it needs uh, a lot of gall to explain it to a country that has been made to think that human space flight is not our cup of tea. So we've overcome that mental block. We're now entering into this new arena of human space flight. And uh, there's a lot to catch up, as you rightly said. And uh, by catching up, let me come to George. George, uh, you are setting up the world's first commercial orbital space station. So not agency driven, but driven by commerce. Your take on it. Um, I think I'm going to stand because otherwise half of you can't see me. Um, so my name is George Weinman. I'm from Blue Origin. And it's my great pleasure to be here today on this illustrious panel. Um, I think that your timing for God on the end is perfect because right about the time that you're proving out the human spaceflight program of India, uh, we will hopefully be just about ready to start proving out our new commercial space station. And I think those two potentially have a, a great relationship and uh, going forward together. Um, if you may, I'm going to give a quick ori orientation to what is Blue Origin because it may not be familiar to all of you. Uh, Blue Origin is a major US aerospace company founded by Jeff Bezos. Um, we are uh, very focused on human spaceflight and the development of orbital resources and um, cislunar resources for the development uh, and benefit of Earth. So our vision is to have millions of people living and working in space for the betterment of Earth. And it's always very fo important to focus back on why we're doing this. Uh, spaceflight is expensive, it's a, it's a major uh, consumer of resources, but it also has an incredible uh, feedback loop to Earth. And it's not simply the industry, the commerce, um, the technology that benefits Earth. It's also the culture. So we've all seen the pictures of Earth from the moon. Um, and we've also seen the many reports from astronauts coming back. Uh, we very much believe that going into space is a, is a comprehensive human endeavor. So arts, culture, architecture, uh, symbolic meanings are all a major part of the journey into space for humankind. Um, Blue Origin has uh, four major el elements or uh, programs to it. We have our new Shepard reusable space uh, suborbital rocket, which is very exciting because it's the only fully reusable rocket out there today. It is suborbital, but the capsule and the launch vehicle uh, booster are both recoverable, and we're learning a great deal about what it means to fly, uh, enjoy, have the excitement, uh, refurbish, and repeat, and how to do that safely and repeatably. 
Um, we have our engine program, which uh, powers all of our, our rockets, including our new Glenn rocket, which is our orbital class uh, rocket that uh, actually can go all the way to the moon. Uh, that is a Saturn V class rocket that will be launching in the next few years. Uh, and then we have um, ADP, which is Advanced Development Programs, which focuses on uh, space mobility, uh, lunar development, and orbital reef under space destinations. So what is orbital reef? Um, it is a commercial space station uh, intended to uh, help replace or go to the next step after the IS International Space Station retires at the end of the decade. Uh, we are committing to have committed to having Orbital Reef up and running several years before uh, ISS is ready to retire. Um, we are under a contract with NASA uh, to help NASA evaluate how they can benefit from Orbital Reef, and we are very much looking forward to making Orbital Reef a global platform, globally accessible uh, to anyone on Earth who wants to be part of uh, spacefaring communities. So. Uh, Orbital Reef is, got a, oops, me, it's got a central spine under which, uh, onto which various uh, application modules can be attached. Uh, those application modules can be developed uh, either on our side or through partners in other countries as well. Um, I would just like to say that the International Space Station has been a great program, but it is limited to a small number of international partners, and we're very excited about the next generation of commercial space stations being available and accessible to a much wider community. So I think that's... Maybe is that a quick overview of, for the five minutes or so? I, I don't want to use up too much time. Sure. We'll come back to you okay. with more questions from the audience later on. Very good. Uh, I'm sure they will have a lot of questions. Good. Uh, yeah, please. Round of applause. Okay, so we are sitting here in Le Meridian, and I, you know, kind of remember that movie Space Odyssey for some reason. You know, Hayward Floyd was traveling in 1999 to Clavius base on the moon and he on the route going to the moon he had a stopover on one of the space stations and that space station was actually a hotel run by Le Meridian's competitor I won't take the name <laughs> H the name start with H and he had a nice stay there there was a restaurant he, he made a calls to his wife his daughter and whatnot all that was imagined in 1968 a year later, we landed on the moon, the humans landed on the moon, and uh, thereafter, human spaceflight has been part of not only our sci-fi folklore, but also part of reality. And when we talk of reality, we have seen the American prowess, the Russian prowess, uh, and then the prowess shown by all the partners of the ISS. But then we are again coming back to an era where uh, countries are wanting to build space stations on their own. Our space station, uh, which uh, Mr. Hutton will speak about, or, or our space flight program, which Mr. Hutton will speak about, uh, is one way moving in that direction. Later on, uh, space station is not the topic for us right now, but uh, going into space is. So I now invite Mr. Hutton to speak on Gaganyan, uh, which will be our first uh, orbital flight carrying three astronauts. and rest of the details from him. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chaitanya, and uh, Honorable Chair, Dr. Uh, Mama Heshran, the Director of the Human Space Flight Center. Of course, he is there in this session today. And uh, Mr. Uh, Akshat Mohite, and also Mr. Paul Feber, and uh, Mr. Rakhavendra, and uh, Mr. George, and all the August uh, audience today. First of all, let me thank for uh, this uh, particular session over here wherein, you know, we could uh, just uh, brief about the Gaganyan project. In fact, uh, uh, the theme is also on the human space flight, and then uh, to uh, give a brief about the project, that is the mandate that has been given. Already, uh, this has been outlined by Dr. Mahmahesh Ryan himself about the human space mission and the program that what India has uh, taken it forward. As uh, you all know that, you know, the way back in 1960s, we started our program, not the human space flight, but then the space program itself, starting with uh, building small sounding rockets. And today we are talking about a 600 ton, a huge rocket called LVM-3. And a few days back we have seen how very beautifully it has hurled all the 36 satellites belonging to OneWeb into very precisely injected into the orbit. And uh, we also got the um, uh, information that all the satellites are doing well. So thanks to the, and congratulations to the total team, the LVM-3 project from uh, the ISO, the OneWeb team, as well as the new space India Limited. I think that glory will continue further and the uh, years to come. 
So now, as uh, already uh, laid out or uh, said by Dr. Bhamaheshwar and this immense space uh, project, if you look at uh, the way that India has come, ISRO or India has come all the way the last uh, 60 years, you know, uh, today in India we have the capability of uh, designing any kind of launch vehicle. Those started with sounding rocket with few kilograms to 600 tons of a huge rocket. Whatever you call like a satellite launch vehicle, SLV, or the augmented satellite uh, launch vehicle called the ASLV or the PSLV, which has already done its uh, so much of a work and as a workhorse launcher of the ISRO. Today, you know, in a few uh, days from now, in the month of November, we are going to have uh, the 56th mission of the, the PSLV also. And already it has clocked more than half a century success also. Very continuous and very, very reliable workhorse launcher of the ISRO. And further on the GSLV and then the latest one, which is otherwise called uh, passionately the fat boy, that is the LVM3, because that is the fattest among all, all the launch vehicles. And in fact, uh, so that is on the launch vehicle part, designing, realizing, building, and the launching, the capability is already there. If you look at on the satellite side also, the various kinds of satellites, you know, starting with the remote sensing satellite for the Earth observation, or the communication satellites, the weather forecasting, or the meteorological satellite, the navigational satellites, and uh, also the, you know, the various uh, science exploration and the disaster warning. And also on the interplanetary front also, you are in a right in 2008 itself, the Chandrayaan-1 mission, which we had uh, already demonstrated, and also in 2019, the Chandrayaan-2 mission by the LVM-3, and the Mangalyaan mission, again by the PSLV in 2014, 13-14 time frame. So look at the interplanetary side also, we have made onto the moon, onto the Mars and all. And also we are now talking about the Aditya L-1 mission, which will be going in maybe in the year to come. So this is a very right time that we also now into step into a new domain called the human space flight. We are not looking at whether the U.S. has done it almost 60 years back and all. No, it is new for us and we also need to have that technology with us. And it is a very right time that the government has also announced, looking into the capabilities of the Indian, you know, the space domain, what we have achieved so far. And uh, we need to also demonstrate our capability of taking humans from the Earth, that too from the Indian soil, in an Indian launch vehicle, and Indian astronauts, maybe the boys or girls, as already uh, said, Bayom or Bahanom, like what our Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, had declared it on 2018 in the, on the Independence Day, that we need to achieve that particular mission before we celebrate 75th anniversary. And as already said, you know, the much work has already gone in, in into this particular domain, but then the target couldn't be achieved before this 25th, uh, 75th anniversary. Of course, due to obvious reasons like the pandemic and other things, like it has affected everywhere the world over and, and not sparing even the, the space arena also. But then it is not, uh, it will not be too far, in maybe in a couple of years, one or two years, we will be able to achieve that. Very great conference is available with us. Uh, though the technologies are new, uh, it, it is totally different from the launch vehicle or from the the satellite domain, we are talking about the payload, the living payload, it is a human. So it, it is a more risky affair that you think about you traveling in that particular vehicle, going up into the skies, into the space, beyond the Karman line of 100 kilometers, and going to 400 kilometers, be there for a couple of days, two or three days, or whatever it is, and then come back safely through the dense atmosphere, and then land safely back. It is not, a, it is not an easy joke or easy, easy task to achieve it. So wherein the Gaganyan project has been announced in 2018, 2019 beginning, and uh, the several works have already commenced. You know, this particular Gaganyan itself, it has got three segments. One, of course, the launch vehicle part, the vehicle which will carry the humans to the orbit, and then it has got an orbital module, the module which consists of both the crew module as well as the service module. Of course, the crew module is the module which is uh, actually housing the, the astronauts. And then you have the service module which will carry out all the servicing functions that it has to give the required amount of power in the form of electric energy, electrical power, and also it should have the propulsive power to take the craft and maintain the craft in the on orbit and also give the required de-boost energy for the craft to come back. And then the last segment is the crew escape system. You know, whatever you talk about, whatever reliable systems you prove, the last 60 years you have done so many launches, more than 75 launches, all successful, more than satellites, whatever you do, there is always a risk element involved in that. We are, we are talking about the, the human crew. So apart from the quality perspective, apart from the reliability of the systems, what we talk about, of course, it should be highly reliable. Whether it should be reliable like 100%, you can never achieve that. Even the aircrafts, it is not 100%. But then if I say that it is 99%, whether the aircraft fellow will accept it, because out of 100 takeoff, take 
takeoffs in one one aircraft there will be a failure means nobody will fly in that because we know that several hundreds of takes off uh, takeoff uh, happening even in india itself so it has to be 99.99 or whatever the number but then what is the reliability that we are talking about for the human space mission we cannot achieve that 99.99999 or 49s and all but then even 99.7 itself is ideally a reliable number even the space shuttle also does that out of one in out of almost 275 space shuttle missions one can fail so that is a kind of the reliability number that we are talking about like 99.7 so that even to achieve that we need to do n number of you know the testing and other things so we talk about quality we talk about reliability but the most important here comes the uh, is about the third factor which is most important is the the safety factor so that is where even if we make any reliable launch vehicle you you have the iot of doubt we call it as known knowns known unknowns and unknown unknowns so whatever the unknown unknowns are there if it happens in the flight the crew must be safely recovered back so that is the most important part of that and that should be there right from the crew or the astronauts or you when you enter into inside the vehicle when you are sitting inside the crew capsule even at the launch pad at sri harikota going to ready to take off and then going in the after mission where you are going to see the environment what the launch vehicle is going to give you in terms of vibration in terms of acoustics in terms of thermal in terms of pressure and etc and so on and then and then you are entering into a deep space maybe in the not a deep space of course it is a low earth orbit of 400 kilometers but then there is no atmosphere over there you know and and you have a sensation of the weightlessness of course gravity is acting everywhere even the moon is also surrounding us or moving around us because of that but then when we call it when we talk about the weightlessness means continuously the object is falling around the earth and you have the sensation of the weightlessness so the microgravity we talk about and then you are going to go through that kind of an experience and now when you are ready after you complete all your orbital stay over there you are now ready to come back in your crew capsule what kind of environment that is going to you know you are going to face with the atmosphere as you descend back from 400 km below 100 km your atmosphere starts and like with the dense light uh, lighter and then you are going to have a denser atmosphere and the most important part is maintaining the integrity of the crew module when you are coming back uh, that is the that is the structural integrity the thermal integrity because what kind of heat flux that you are going to face something like we talk about 25 degree centigrade over here inside this hall air condition but when you are coming back it is almost like three order 2000 degree centigrade 2500 not a metal will withstand that but then inside the craft you know you need to maintain 25 degrees then outside is burning with 2000 degrees and you can the crew can see the flames outside through the viewports so that is a kind of you know the protection that we need to give for the crew capsule like in way of structural rigidity in way of thermal uh, you know the, the stability for the i mean the structure so the thermal protection system design is also very very important so that is at another thing so what i am telling is that right from lift off when you board the vehicle till you ascend back and uh, till you come back and safely impact and we are not landing in land we are going to land in sea waters near the indian coast and then but then you have to be safe so in this if there is any amount of you know the uh, called a failure or something if it happens the crew must be safely ejected back for which a crew escape system also the third segment of that which has to be part of the human rider vehicle that will be at the top of the vehicle unfortunately uh, because of short in time you know I, otherwise i could have shown you in in pictorially also how it how it represents so if you look at these three segments it has got a, several new technologies uh, apart from whatever we do for the launch vehicle or for the satellite new technologies in the sense even for the launch vehicle itself we need to have that kind of you know the human rating part of it when we say it is they it is the same vehicle which we are going to fly the vehicle which has already done five missions the lvm3 uh, right in the x, x mission the experimental mission in 2014 and followed by three very successful mission and the latest one the fifth mission which carried one word the vehicle is very very rugged and very reliable uh, but then it has got a new technology sort together we have to make it human rated when we talk about human rating it is about the margins that we give for the vehicle in terms of structural margin in terms of thermal margin in terms of redundancy is what we give for the avionics and in terms of self monitoring whether the vehicle is okay or not like somebody should reside in the vehicle to tell that i am okay till i reach the orbit something called the health monitoring system this is also a new thing which is being there so that every phase of the mission you know when the solid propulsion system works or thereafter when the liquid propulsion system or the cryogenic stages when it works it has to tell that yes i am okay any moment if it is not okay immediately it has to give the signal to the crew escape system which is there at the top of the vehicle which will sense and then immediately it will eject out taking the crew module like a bird carrying a small you know the chick 
and then like that it has to take the crew module with the crew inside and go safely away from the vehicle because the vehicle if it had become mad what is going to happen is going to be terrible because when explosion if it happens you know then you should be away from that and very quickly you need to move away from that so you will have the fast acting solid motors which is there as part of the crew escape system which will take away the crew module to the safety and then it will it will land back so that that kind of a technology needs to be put in the human rated launch vehicle to make it totally human rated in giving all the needed uh, redundancies in terms of avionics because normally in any launch vehicle or a satellite we fly dual redundancy for the avionics like primary chain and redundancy chain redundant chain but then here when we talk about the human rating we need to give multiple redundancies as per the standards of nasa or esa or or even that uh, russian standards you know and uh, yes surely we need to have our own standards so we need to keep either triple redundancy or the quadruple redundancy for the avionics system so like that on the launch vehicle segment these are the new technologies that are that are there but on the crew crew module or on the orbital module as we call it the crew module and the service module as already uh, said by dr mamageshwar the most important in the crew module is the life support system because you are there or we are there inside the crew module and once the crew module goes to space that is the earth you know whatever you want you, you should get from within the crew module so the required main thing is the required atmosphere the oxygen part of that because we have got a finite resource we carry oxygen and that is the one which is going to limit you your stay in the orbit so the life support system is the most important thing which is a totally a new technology we are dealing with maintaining the uh, pure atmosphere inside the uh, the craft as well as maintaining the required amount of the partial pressures of oxygen is available similarly the thermal environment also needs to be maintained and uh, uh, the other thing like crew seat the consoles and also kind of a technology needed and similarly the uh, and when he comes back uh, as i mentioned earlier as he has he descends through the atmosphere the terrible atmosphere atmosphere or the terrible intense heat flux it is not you know 1 watt per centimeter square it is going to be Uh, several hundreds like 250 watts per centimeter square which will heat up the structure even to more than 2500 degrees centigrade so this kind of technology are very much needed which are uh, which which, which uh, currently we have already completed that so coming to the current uh, development what we have done the human rating part of the vehicle is totally done all have been demonstrated through the various uh, ground simulation ground test and uh, etc and the other orbital module as well as the crew escape system already we have entered into the real design is completed they entered into the realization phase and then we are going to demonstrate all these things through several flights so before we take up the manned mission really we need to prove all these technologies through several flights in the sense we call it as test vehicle missions where we will simulate the failures and then see that the abort we call it as a crew escape system how it is going to function so that is the one which is going to happen in a couple of months some of these flights have to go before we really go even to the test flight the unmanned vehicle so once all these crew escape system validation is completed we will be ready for the unmanned flight wherein without the man the full system the full complement of the vehicle like uh, the launch vehicle the crew escape system as well as, well as the orbital module will be part of this unmanned vehicle and that will go to the orbit be there for 2 3 days and it will come back we need to carry out such a minimum two flights successfully before we carry out the manned mission so here one more uh, theme is that what is the industry take away in that or industry participation as you are all aware that the industry in fact whatever the budget that is allocated to the isro no or to uh, building a launch vehicle or a satellite 80 percentage or more is going back to the industry by way of because you know the industries are only making the raw materials for it they are only making the hardware for it whether it is the launch vehicle structures or the propellant tanks or for the solid motor segments or for the avionics or for the avionics part of that so all these things are maybe um, built by the industries only but then when we talk about that simply you know the industry has to transform itself from just a producer of this hardware from technologies you know they have to give the technologies whatever that is needed for the for the for the future deep space mission because when we call about deep space mission it is not that going to leo 400 km and coming back it is to moon mars and things like that where even one way trip to the mars will take about 10 months and then we need to come back so we can't talk about a life support system where you carry the oxygen with you it is not going to serve you for one year two year and all we need to have a regenerative life support system so that is one new technology which we need to build in similarly we need to have habitats habitats made of light white you know the structures composite structures a foldable structure we need to you know enter into a new manufacturing process making the friction stir welding as one of the process for building most efficient uh, joints for the structural metallic elements 
Similarly, the e equipment, uh, what you call the electron beam welding process for the two modules, structures and things like that. Like that, low low density thermal protection system is also one of the very important new technologies that we need to build. Like that, there are several new technologies also we need to build for when we talk about the deep space missions, wherein the industries have to come forward, not only from making only the hardware or making the system integration or making the stages integration, of course, that is what is happening today, but then they have to also step in, in the uh, make research and then come out with uh, huge technologies which will always take us for missions like uh, exploring into you know the deep space missions and of course with the humans in the loop so that's all from me thank you very much thank you very much mr hutton for that very passionate human space flight 101 in 5 minutes uh, as you understand, uh, carrying humans into outer space is, uh, we are heavy, you know, I'm not talking about our payload mass, but we are tech heavy, you know, it, it requires not only an entire village, but it requires, you know, many, many cities to uh, execute such kind of missions. And for that complexity, uh, the participation from industry, as you rightly said, uh, is very important. But it's not about industry providing certain elements to the space agency and then space agency executing it. It's about innovating continuously. And when I talk about innovation, I have somebody with us next to me. He feels that he is out of the place, but I am pretty sure that he's not. Uh, Paul, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Kirin. So uh, it's a great honor to be here. And in preparation for this session, I started to reflect. And I think when we were all children, certainly my children, there were two things that were really exciting. One was dinosaurs, and the other one was space monsters. By the time they were seven, they didn't want to be an archaeologist, but they did want to be an astronaut. And, and I think that's, some, you, what you can hear is the passion within the people here. So my name's Paul Ferber, I work at a research and technology organisation in space in the UK. We are, really exist to help to translate some of the research the academic research and science through technology into industry. But what's really interesting is, is how space science really influences everything that we have today on our planet. And I think it's really interesting to look back because the whole aspect of science and international endeavour is enshrined in the Outer Space Act right from the dawn of the space age. And it's the way in which we should be working together for common good. And I'd also like to reflect on the fact that the two, two different aspects of space science are brought together in this same colloquium today. We're talking about human space flight, and we're talking about deep space. And I'd just like to reflect about the differences between those. So the UK has been a supporter uh, on an international stage for space science and human space flight. Our first astronaut, Helen Sharman, and more recently Tim Peake, have really been a passionate evangelists and inspirations for our young generation. Evangelists for space and inspiration for, the, for people coming into the sector. And as Catapult, what we were doing was setting up the links so that as the space station came over with Tim Peake on board, he could connect with schools and talk to them about the science that was taking place on the space station. And I, I think we forget sometimes that actually the space station is a hotbed of scientific endeavour. And the astronauts that go into space, the cosmonauts, they undertake science every day. And it's the power of putting the, the flexibility of the human mind and, and, and our ability to actually do multiple things is really important to generate the maximum benefit from the scientific endeavours. We are seeing now advances in medicine on the space station. We're seeing advances in material science and manufacturing coming through from the space station science. So, for instance, the new generation, perhaps, of, of optical fibers that we're going to need for some really interesting quantum key distribution mechanism things, all taking place on the space station right now. And, and that brings me to, to my thought about, well, what does it mean then from the perspective of how industry and the, the scientific community can work together? So just reflecting on, on this, this aspect then, we can see there that the, the human aspect really brings some of the, um, the, the opportunity for doing deep science. When I th started to think about the deep space though, what's interesting there is we shouldn't just think about 
humans in deep space. The deep space science includes things like the square kilometre array, looking into space, looking into the origins of the universe. It includes things like the Hubble Space Telescope and more recently the James Webb Telescope, really helping us to understand the origins of the universe. And I think these are really interesting things because some of the technologies that have been developed there to support that have direct applicability to industry. And I'll even go further. If we go back at things like the Pioneer missions, the deep space probes and the Mars missions, what's really interesting there, the technologies that were developed to allow us to operate those missions, enshrined in some of the standards like the CCSDS standards, things like low density parity check codes, those are used today in 5G. We use them today to enable us to connect communities around the world. And the, the origins were in the space domain. It's really important that we recognize this and actually participate in the future. Things like the internet. Actually, one of the key protocols for the internet, which is TCP, TCP, IP, actually the way in which those protocols were developed and enhanced 20 years ago to enable space operations are used in the Internet of Things today. It's really fascinating when you actually look at the translational aspects. So that's the background and we're involved to a degree but we're not space scientists but we're connected with a community in the UK, the Rutherford Appleton Labs and the lots of the space scientist communities also looking to keep space safe. We mustn't forget the debris aspects. You know, we've really got to make sure that if we're going to put people in space, we need to make sure that we can observe and protect individuals who reserve the environment. So I'd just like to reflect on where we might be going next, and, and perhaps we can talk a bit more on the panel, about the technologies that are necessary. Not only the launch capability in keeping people safe, but actually we need to communicate. We need to communicate with astronauts in space. We can do that through inter-satellite links and relays. We'll need photonics and optical systems that allow us to go deeper, to do lunar communications, to do Mars communications, to do the whole aspect of, of, of uh, the solar communications. We need new positioning technologies. The technologies that have been developed along the track for synchronization and for, uh, for high accuracy science are really going to be necessary taken out to positioning assets in space, especially when you need to do things like orbital conjunction maneuvers, um, new technologies for doing this. So, so the positioning systems that we put in space today for commercial purposes need to be extended even further to support new operations in space. Observation, clearly, the, the synthetic handling of this rich data is going to be a, an area that we can continue to develop. Um, but I'd also like to bring a couple of other aspects in. The robotics piece. It's not the case that everything will be done by humans. The aspects of understanding what the universe is like um, but also going out and exploring, whether it be on asteroids or, and, or whether it be on uh, other uh, uh, orbital bodies. The, uh, the opportunities for taking some of the research that we're doing in, in, in this domain, translating it into uh, the, the things that we do every day are really fascinating. So that's what, it, what makes me motivated um, to, to continue to work and to understand all the fantastic things that are going on in the science community and how do we bring it into effect for commercial purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. You know, innovation is at the heart of human space flight in this second golden age that is coming of human space flight. Uh, the first was, of, of course, the Apollo era, but uh, with uh, the Artemis Accords, uh, with the plans for commercial space stations, with the International Lunar Research Station, uh, where the Chinese and Russians are participating, and then. Eventually, us, we, once we get there with Gaganyan successfully, we are pretty sure, confident of that. Uh, we are confident of our people here. Uh, you know, there is a massive potential for Indian industry to participate not only in our human space flight uh, projects, but also projects that are happening all over the world. And there are a multitude of them. You know, we want to engage with all our partners internationally and who better than the best of the industries uh, of India that have been contributing to our strategic projects for quite some time. And we have amongst us uh, Raghavindraji. Raghavindraji, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that uh, quick introduction. Uh, I'm Raghavindra. I represent Lassen Tubro. 
uh, which is an Indian multinational uh, operating in various strategic uh, sectors of this country. We have been called as the company which is building this nation. So having said that, coming back to uh, the topic of uh, human space, uh, for over the last five decades, I believe industry has been partnering ISRO uh, as a manufacturing front for most of its space programs, be it the launch vehicle program or the satellite program, or building various uh, test facilities or key infrastructure that is required uh, to be made. So uh, having said that, uh, if you really look at industry has only been a manufacturer. It has never been in a position where it has worked on design of space especially. The need was not there. So uh, currently, if you look at various initiatives that has been taken for moving out of um, providing our manufacturing subsystems, government has taken initiatives of uh, uh, launching the complete PSLV. That is now industry is moving up from a component manufacturer to a system integrator. So that's the role industry has been playing. And uh, if, you, if you really look at the Gaganyan program also, the industry had played a significant role in manufacturing of various systems for the launch vehicle. And uh, industry has gone through the nuances of the human rating, which, uh, which was very, very essential uh, for this particular program. And also it has understood uh, some of the quality systems, the, the concept of uh, absolute quality which ISRO has brought out, which is a combination of uh, safety, quality, security, reliability, mission time and mission cost. So this is something which has been imbibed by the industry as we go ahead uh, with the manufacturing. Now the focus has shifted from first time right to every time right. Because uh, mission assurance and mission safety is a priority. So uh, having said that, uh, I would like to also bring out uh, how uh, NASA, when uh, they started getting into the human space programs, had a very uh, close collaboration with the US Navy because a lot of uh, risks and technologies associated with deep sea and deep space, a lot of commonality with them. So if you look at the defense that has opened up for uh, private participation for the last uh, two decades now, and if you see a uh, nuclear submarine has been completely made by a private industry. So there is a design capability which is existing within the country. But there was no need. So now is the time when we are looking at human space programs but there needs to be a healthy collaboration between ISRO and the industry in jointly developing certain key technologies. And of course, not just ISRO, also collaboration like you brought out with the Global Best in actually bringing out, developing those technology and participating in the human space flight program. So that's my take on this particular thing. Thank you. Thank you. That was brief, but the intention was clear that our industries are ready and raring to go and partner with not only uh, domestic entities and our uh, you know national aspirations, but they also want to plug themselves internationally. Uh, and when we talk about international partnerships, uh, and when we think of Indians going abroad, uh, one of the biggest component of that is uh, our young students who go out there. Uh, for a very long time, Innovating in this country was a hard task because uh, it was burdened by a lot of red tapeism. But with the advent of Startup India, with the advent of uh, Digital India, and many of the ministries are now nurturing you know, hundreds of startups. Same way when uh, ISRO undertook the space reforms in, during the thick of the pandemic, no, it wasn't that we didn't do anything during the pandemic. It, uh, you know, it sort of went back to the desk, and they did reforms that they couldn't have done when things were up and moving. So they used that solitude to make those, you know, uh, fundamental changes in the way space is being approached. And out of that, uh, as we call in India, Sagar Manthan uh, came. Uh, at least for now, we are around 150 startups. Uh, the numbers will grow they would want to engage with the Indian industry, Indian academia, international academia. And we have one amongst them, Akshat Mohite from Astrobon Technologies. Akshat, over to you. Yeah. 
Yep. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Akshat Mohite, co-founder and CEO for Astrobon Space and Defense Technologies. I'm certain that we have a less amount of time, so I'll keep it short. Uh, I'll divide this whole thing into two segments, let's say. In the first one, I'll talk about the brief overview of the market size and the opportunity that uh, we might be having. And in the second segment, I'd like to talk about what Astrobon space and defense technology is going to do in the human space flight sector, in the private human space flight sector. So talking about the market itself, the let's say the reason I entered into it, one of the reasons of course, so we in 2021, the market for human space flight was valued at 595 million USDs. And within a year, in 2022, it has already reached 698 million USD, of course, the global human space flight market. So we are seeing a 37% CAGR growth from 2021 to 2030. And the reason, what is the reason for fueling such a growth? Let's say first is advancement in technology. Second would be interested high-valued individuals to invest in such kind of commercial space flight programs or space tourism program. Third would be increased research and development from the private and the government sector. Now, talking about the private sector, uh, they have been, you know, Axiom, there's Blue Origin, there's SpaceX who have been carrying out commercial space flight program, and that's when I actually thought in India we should be the one who should take a step forward and enter the private sector for commercial space flight. That's when we started with Astrobon Space and Defense Technologies. So Astrobon is planning to set up the India's very first private astronaut training facility. Um, in Bangalore itself, we have been planning to do this since a year now, and also development of crew module, which would be able to launch um, private astronauts, commercial astronauts to space, for which we collaborated with Ethereal X um, with their, for their launch capabilities and send astronauts to LEO. Of course, this is a very, um, let's say, a critical task because there are humans involved and building human-grade equipments is one of the difficult tasks and that's one of the problems that we are currently tackling by <clears throat> having industry experts by our sides. So that's all I would like to say about what we have been doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Akshat. You know, it's nice to hear the youth of India talking about CAGR. <laughs> you know, that's the way to go. That's the way innovation is going to happen, where uh, the commerces and the humanities and the sciences and the technologies, all these streams come together. So we are now opening up the panel for Q&A. Um, rather than me asking questions, I'm sure most of our audience. A few comments uh, or thought process, I would say. I'm indeed delighted to see this youngster talking about uh, making a crew module and uh, also astronaut training center. Uh, really fascinating. Uh, I wish you all the best and probably we have to have some discussions also in future. I, I really uh, love that. That is first part. Second part is as uh, our, uh, Raghavendra was talking about, already the concept of uh, industry uh, uh, developing a technology which is uh, needed for human space is uh, in the anvil. Uh, we started this with a kind of, uh, what shall we say, uh, expression of interest for some of the experiments that we can do in the crew module during the unmanned missions. And that uh, we had a very good response and uh, uh, some of the, uh, the I think uh, three or four have been shortlisted for flying in the unmanned mission. That is for the experiments part. But we would like to extend it further with respect to the core technology, some of the core technologies that is uh, very essentially needed, uh, especially uh, beyond Gaganyan, let us say. The Gaganyan we are talking about 400 kilometers, uh, the maximum three crew for three days or whatever it is. But we need to go beyond that. We need to have our own space station. A lot of uh, next to, uh, till 2030, we have a good, very good roadmap uh, of what we need to do till 2030 and also uh, based on Honorable Prime Minister's uh, vision, we are also giving a roadmap of what we need to do up to 2047. So, so that also is on the anvil. So, I think a lot of exciting opportunities are there. We are already thinking of giving one uh, expression of industry industries to, with respect to development of uh, key technologies in a very win-win kind of way. That is also there. I would like to mention that. Thank you.
Yeah. Can we have a mic, please, for the Q audience? Yeah. Uh, good morning to everyone. To him. My name is Aditya. I am from Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. I had a question for Mr. George here. Uh, so your orbital reef uh, has a life habitat on it, which is an inflatable habitat. Am I correct? So, uh, so this is a. Uh, as we know, uh, the launch vehicles around the world have a limitation in the payload fairing to accommodate the living habitat space. Talking about uh, ha having, talking about having colonizations in other planets or in the space station where we where we may need to put. Uh, many a lot crew members or the tourists which may be going in the future for space tourism. So there is a limitation of the payload fairing uh, uh, volume where we want to put a living space. So inflatables are a way to go uh, ahead as one of the major uh, technologies. So this orbital reef uh, having a life habitat on it which is inflatable, what are the kind of challenges you are facing uh, in developing that uh, inflatable system and what are the uh, 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 where do you stand right now in developing it and what kind of uh, uh, problems you are facing or what are the solutions you are addressing, uh, can you just give a brief on that? Sure. So, so one of the uh, one of the interesting things about Orbital Reef is that it is um, it's actually a cooperation of a number of different companies. So it includes Blue Origin and Sierra Space as the two founding partners, uh, and then a number of other companies as team members, uh, mostly from the United States, but we're looking forward to adding more global partners and team members as well. Um, the live habitat that you mentioned is developed by our partner company, Sierra Space. Um, one of the reasons they developed it is exactly as you mentioned, the volume of a fairing, uh, the top of the launch vehicle, which most of the payloads go, um, is limited. And so when you get onto space, you want to have as much volume as you can so that you can fill it up with people and experiments and other fun things to do. Um, we actually at Blue Origin have taken a slightly different approach, but it's complementary to Sierra Space. Uh, one of the great things about New Glenn is we have a very, very large fairing. Um, so most uh, rockets today are about a five meter fairing is a typical standard for a heavy launch vehicle. Our fairing is seven meters. Um, and there is all sorts of interesting ideas about how we can maximize the use of that. And for those of you who are technically minded, of course, uh, the uh, di radius of the fairing uh, increases the volume by cube, so you're getting a lot more space with a small, uh, that increase in, in, uh, in fairing volume. So if you look at the pictures of Orbital Reef, you'll see that we do have these large life habitats attached to it. And we also have these large, almost the same size uh, metal habitats uh, that are we call core modules or application modules. And uh, those are uh, take advantage of our large New Glenn uh, fairing capability. So there's more than one way to crack the nut, and we think that both are interesting, and that's why we have both on Orbital Reef. To answer your question about what's challenging about it, um, uh, soft goods in space are a new thing, and they have, there's no really well-established certification protocol for that. We understand how to build uh, metal objects that are under, under pressure and how they fail and their failure modes very well. Um, we've got a lot of experience with that both on Earth and in space. But soft goods, essentially balloons, um, you know, you blow them up and then how do they fail? And if they fail, do they fail catastrophically? And so there's a lot of technology going into the material science and the technology to um, make sure that that capability is good. And I'm very happy to tell you that our partners just did a burst test. It was very exciting because it burst and it was very loud, um, but it was very successful. In fact, much more successful than we expected. So the technology is there. Um, it is a it's a great, interesting capability because it does allow us to get bigger and bigger and in smaller and smaller packages. So I think uh, one of the exciting things about Orbital Reef is that we are developing new technologies that will help with future exploration, uh, whether it's to the moon or to Mars or to other uh, opportunities in the cislunar space. In a lighter vein, uh, I don't know whether you have seen it, he, he was mentioning about Odyssey, Fulim Odyssey, the way uh, Blue Origin has designed the, 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 the cabin at least, in pictorially, it is looked like better than a five-star hotel. It's like a Flash Garden movies, I would say. Movies and space are a thing that's going to happen. So. Yeah, it can be loud. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from the Center of Excellence in... Uh, <laughs> you, you can go first. I'll, I'll okay. um, from the Center of Excellence in Space Sciences India. So I want to get a perspective in that none of you touched upon. 
uh, which is the space environment intelligence. Uh, if you are looking at these space missions, uh, human space flight and Blue Origins plans for a spaceship and up in space, you need to understand space weather as well. Uh, I mean, you can get a million things right, you get one thing wrong, and, and that's it, right, in space. So I want to get a perspective both from ISRO uh, as well as Blue Origins. Uh, what, is, what is your thinking on this? Are you, are you worried about the space environment? Are you even aware of it? SpaceX was not. Uh, and we all found out about this in February when the last 38 satellites to a geomagnetic storm. Uh, so what is the thinking on this? Are you, are you also thinking along this ancillary lines of, of space environmental intelligence that you need to be aware of? George? Yeah, actually, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, yes, we are very much aware of uh, space environmental issues. Uh, let me say that we are much more worried with respect to the uh, number of elements in the space, debris as well as active, uh, than the space weather. Of course, geomagnetic storms also we are aware of. And uh, practically, uh, uh, our design concept is always very conservative, unlike the present uh, trend of using quartz elements, for, I am giving an example only, uh, to reduce the cost and uh, sustainability kind of scenario. We don't go for that. And uh, uh, pretty well, I think we are, uh, uh, to our knowledge, uh, minusing the so-called unknown unknowns that is always there. Any space mission is, uh, probability is 50-50 only, that you know. But unknown unknowns, we need to take care by our experience, the kind of margins that we built in, the kind of design margins that we have, the kind of protection that we give, the kind of reliable components that we put. So this is, because of all these things, this doesn't come cheap. That, that, that is a negative part of it, but we need, in, in missions like where humans are there, we cannot too much compromise on that. So with respect to those aspects, EMI aspects and all, we are well aware and we are, we, we are I would say, we have much good control on that. But with respect to space debris, yes, this you know, phenomena is very, very uh, disturbing, I would say, because now with the kind of Leo constellations that is coming up, people are talking about one million, uh, <laughs> kind of one, not lakhs, that kind of uh, uh, satellites in the orbit, in the, in, in the next, uh, it, it is really a big problem. Even now it is a problem because every time, every day, every minute we are monitoring the situation and uh, accordingly we have to take evasive actions if required, if there is a threat of collision. So this is a reality and you know uh, we don't have much knowledge or the world itself doesn't have much knowledge with respect to materials, debris that is less than one meter in size. That is a big problem. So this, uh, this exists, so we need to take care with respect to protection, providing shields, all those technologies are there. We are trying, but yes, space debris is a problem which we need to attend because it's a, two sides of the same coin. This issue is there, yes. Okay, two quick and last questions. Okay, I'll make it short. So uh, I'm Arin from IIT Bombay, and uh, I'm also part of a company called Inspecity, uh, very much in line with uh, George's thoughts. Um, so um, the point I wanted to make about uh, economics, uh, I don't want to go into technology at the moment, is that um, I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs are thinking along the same lines. Right now, the cost of sending somebody up there is about $55 million. So if you take a 100 kg person, uh, you know, it's about half a million dollar per kg. When do we do it at a, an order of magnitude lesser price? This is for ISRO as well as for Blue Origin as a whole. My answer when people get healthy. Oh, no, no, no. It's still, <laughs> if you make it lower, the cost goes up. So it goes up to $1 million per kg at that time. Right. I'll give a very quick answer to that. Um, so one of the exciting things about our new Glenn rocket is it is a reusable rocket, at least the first stage. Uh, we continue to look at further reusability technologies going forward. Uh, we hear rumors that there are people in India also looking at reusable technology, and, and I think the next decade is going to see some fantastic advances in those capabilities. So um, yes, reusability will bring down costs. Uh, we're also getting better at uh, how do we do this and making it uh, the overall system's lower cost to develop. Uh, and as that knowledge spreads, it will uh, continue to improve uh, access to space. It's not only the rocket boosters, by the way. It's also other aspects of moving around in orbit and um, uh, coming back from orbit as well. There's a lot of different ways to improve on this uh, capability. 
Yeah, primarily the, the best answer is uh, go for reusability. No questions on that. So we are also on the, on the job. I mean, it may take some more time, but we are on the job of uh, first uh, demonstration of a subscale is already proved, but that is that is only a beginning. Now the full scale model is we, we are going to be getting tested. So that is then we are combining the reusability with uh, a kind of uh, air breathing engine technology so that uh, that much payload can be improved, improvement can be there. So all these things are uh, in the experimental stage. But let me also tell you that, uh, as we did in our mission to Mars, we have an inherent uh, uh, system wherein, due to, I don't want to get into that uh, specifics now, we will never uh, reach 55 million even on our first mission. Okay, last question. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Abhinesh. Uh, I'm the founder of Big Deeper Exploration Technologies. We are developing autonomous robots for lunar operations. So my question is around that. Uh, so two sub questions. One is like, what are our plans beyond uh, Gagan for Gaganyan beyond uh, uh, you know Leo? Are we looking at lunar uh, sort of landing on Moon also? Because the world is going there in the next five to seven years. And the second is the role of Moon, uh, specifically from George, the role of Moon in providing fuel essentially as a source of fuel to all the commercial stations which we are targeting in the orbit, which we are looking at a big number in coming years. Uh, with respect to our future plans, right. that's... Are we looking at last yeah. moon also? You know, what we are planning, uh, as I said, you know, till 2030, we will be continuing the Gaganian program as such, and we are also having plans of uh, uh, having our own habitat, of kind of our own space station, which may not be the way others do, it will be an Indian specific space station which we may be, uh, which we are attempting. So that is in the design uh, or discussion stage only now. But we would, like, if it is possible, our target is should be between 2032 to 2035. That time frame we should be able to launch our own space station. One, one biggest problem or it's not a problem, one uh, which we are tackling is we need to have a, as he said, you know, we need to have a, a powerful launch vehicle to take care of the uh, payload mass. So that is why now we have already declared our new generation launch vehicle, NGLV, which is also on the design stage. So hopefully by 2030 we will have our NGLV also flying, which will solve our problem. So this is the two-pronged attack we are talking with respect to our immediate uh, requirement after Gaganyan. There, and definitely thought process with respect to going to moon, uh, everything is there. And uh, also uh, uh, kind of uh, once we are in a position where we have the capability and we have the technology to, to do this, so we will be thinking about collaborations also at that time. Yeah. I know we're short on time, so I'll try and keep a quick answer. So, so I think one of the exciting things about the moon is, thanks to an Indian space probe, we actually know a lot about uh, the water availability on the moon. Uh, with water, you can sustain life, but you can also make rocket fuel. And so uh, Blue Origin is very focused on uh, how do we take advantage of those resources on the moon? There's also a lot of other things on the moon. It looks barren, but it's actually quite, quite a lot down in those rocks. And I think the more that we uh, explore and, and understand what's there, we're going to find that there's a lot more that can be done. Um, and I think that the vision of a, a cis-lunar cis economy, how do we build uh, a economic relationship between the resources on the moon and, and Earth for the betterment of Earth, is going to be a fantastic uh, area to explore in the future. Um, I just want to make one other quick mention. Um, one thing that people sometimes uh, miss about space is that uh, it's all exciting, and the, the adventurism, and the, the heroes, and the technology accomplishments, and all the things we do to accomplish that is very, very exciting. It is also a very unique environment. Microgravity um, and enables us to do things differently, and low lunar gravity may allow us to do things differently than we do on Earth. Uh, you don't all realize this, but right now you all have a gravity problem. And we're here to fix that. So I would just like to say that I think uh, as we move into space, the learning how to uh, adapt to microgravity, how to use microgravity commercially and uh, through civil efforts uh, for the betterment of the human population is going to be dramatically uh, helpful to us, uh, whether it's in biotech, material sciences, um, also for agriculture, uh, learning to deal with the radiation environment in space actually 
teaches us new things about how we can use radiation to explore uh, all the hidden genes and capabilities in our, our life systems and cycles on Earth. There's a lot there. And so we're very excited about that as, as Blue Origin. And, and just real quick mention, uh, we have a program called Reef Starter, which uh, my colleague Logan is going to talk about more in the uh, startup panel later. Um, but you should check it out. Uh, it's a Reef Starter Challenge. Uh, it's on the web. And it is a uh, grant program uh, to encourage people to look at microgravity and what things they can do in microgravity and how to build a business based on microgravity and how we can help you achieve that dream. OK, uh, one last, the youngest and most passionate in the room wants to ask a question. OK, please go ahead. All right. Uh, OK. So uh, uh, I'm Venka Chavan Patnaik, and uh, I'm uh, really fortunate to be here thanks to uh, all the fraternity for allowing me to be here. That includes President Sir and uh, uh, DG Sir. Uh, my question uh, to you uh, especially, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ume, uh, Umeshwaran and uh, Mr. Hutton, uh, my question was that uh, why has been the you know Gaganyan delaying since uh, you know since uh, uh, the past six years? Like uh, we were earlier told to be uh, you know launched at 2021, 2023 now. 2026 it has been pushing back and uh, why is that and uh, what are the challenges that are being faced uh, that are causing this to happen we are all waiting for you to grow up and take charge <laughs> <laughs> exactly anyway i think hatan will answer this <laughs> yeah that's a nice question Anyway, that is a natural question also, why this has been the delay. As already said, you know, the basic, uh, some of the few technologies uh, only we could uh, develop earlier. As already in Shama said, in 2007, the spacecraft re recovery experiment we did, wherein we approved this uh, re-entry technology. That is, when you come back, what kind of uh, thermal, as I was mentioning, the thermal loads and how to tackle that. So that was developed. And similarly, in 2014, we had the X mission. X mission means by the LVM-3, the first flight. Uh, it didn't have a cryo stage. In fact, we had simulated a cryo stage. So uh, there, uh, the main objective was to prove the vehicle up to that point. And also, we carried a crew module atmospheric re-entry experiment. Like our current crew module, that time also we had carried, wherein we have approved the technology of re-entry navigation, as well as the propulsion system in onboard. Similarly, in 2018 also, the, the crew escape system, which I mentioned, that we need to uh, carry out experiments and ensure that the crew is going to be the, uh, very safe in that uh, entire mission. This particular test also we have done. One kind of such test like, is called pad about test. That means if something happens at the launch pad, how the crew will be safety. But these are all the only very precursor missions. But then several new technologies like the life support system, as well as, as one gentleman has already spoke about, the radiation isolation. You know, in space, you are talking about the challenges. It is in a brief way, it is called a RIDGE, R-I-D-G-E. That R stands for radiation in the space, and I stands for isolation, that you are going to be away from the Earth. And then D stands for the distance from the Earth, and G stands for the microgravity, the gravity part of that. And E, of course, the environment. Uh, we talk about the hostile environment that we are going to face. About. So these are all the challenges in, in in physical terms, in engineering terms, you need to make all the technologies for overcoming all these things. And apart from that, as already said about the, the space debris, see, uh, talking about space debris, and then uh, we are talking about in LEO, uh, for, we are fortunate that in LEO, we, did, we don't have that kind of a uh, population. That's why uh, it's all preferred to go to 400 to 450 kilometer, where our ISS is also going. But then when you talk about 800 kilometers or even beyond that, the population density is very huge. So how to take care of that? One is that you clean the space. That is a very, very difficult task. And other thing is to protect to protect your uh, systems against this uh, collision, or what we call it as MMOD. That is called micro meteorite orbital debris protection we need to do. So whatever the crew capsule you are going to take in orbit, you should have a protective mechanism so that even a particle which is traveling at a speed of 7 kilometers per second, mind you, it's about 20 times the speed of the sound. The Mach number we call it as. So that small particle in millimeters, if it comes and impinges on the crew module structure, which is an aluminum structure of 8 mm thick, it can simply pierce it. 
even with a small specular, I mean, a, a speckle of a particle. So what kind of protective system you are going to make? It's called MMOD protection. This is also one key technology which we need to develop that. So all these things, you know, we are we are having a good grasp of that, but then it needs to be, it is already designed, and it's a question of uh, realizing it and doing it. But there was a delay, of course, because of many reasons, as we mentioned, but then sooner or later, you know, in a couple of one or two years, everything will get demonstrated. So definitely, as uh, Mr. Chaitanya mentioned, uh, but then we need not have to wait uh, for him to grow up to that adult stage. <laughs> but then we will be doing that much before that. Thank you. Thank you. Just, to add, uh, just to add to your, uh, it's a very valid question. We could have done, we, did, we never told it is 2020. Eh? We told only 2022. <laughs> we could not do in 2022, but we lost two years, predominantly due to COVID. In India, the situation is very unique, you know. Because industries are all spread out, our offices are all spread out, no industry is working, we cannot move out, no vehicle is going, everything was a standstill, right? So we lost two years. We are trying to make up of those two years, but still it's very, very difficult to make up. That's why we told 24 rent. Okay. Okay. Without taking much time, thank you so much. Uh, the panel is all yours for discussions in the lobby yeah in the lobby and please ask them the question and uh, here you answer thank you so much Oh, Mr. Paul.